Hello, it's going to take me two seconds to get set up here. I never realized how dry my theater bio sounds, uh, but there you go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, so, I, uh, I'm going to go off script right at the beginning. <laughs> I have 30 minutes uh, prepared and I'm going to go off script uh, because I just want to acknowledge what Heather presented and I just want to say it's really interesting for me because I'm actually going to talk about some th a completely different feel about the work and for me it comes from displacement and I have to say that having seen what Heather's done and having spent about an hour talking to Ivan earlier on, I feel like a fake. And it's great as an artist sometimes to feel as a fake, to feel out of place, to feel like you don't know what you're doing. And I hope that the story that I'm going to tell you will exemplify that. <laughs> so I've been at MTYP now for three years in November, and I brought my family uh, here to Manitoba. We're all very proud Winnipeggers. That's MTYP. And that's my family. Now. Uh, I love them all. I'm not just putting the picture there because I'm a proud papa. But uh, I wanted to show you, that's Isabel there on Carrie's lap, that she was less than a year old. It's only been two years. This is Isabel now. <laughs> so, as somebody who works for young audiences, that's how fast my audience changes. <laughs> Within two years, they're completely different human beings. It's a moving target. That's what we do. So um, I'm going to tell you uh, that as an artistic director and as a theater maker, um, I do a couple of things. I play for a living. And I don't mean that in sort of some disrespectful way of saying, oh, we just play. Uh, I actually mean we play very rigorously. Trust me, we're going through our financial audit right now, and there's nothing fun about that. But that there's a real structure, a rigor to the work that we do in creating work for young audiences. So that's the first thing I do. And the second thing I do, like Heather, like Ivan, I tell stories. So there's going to be a whole bunch of stories in this presentation, starting with my own. Um, I, uh, I came to Canada when I was 15 years old. And uh, I came through a, a college, through a, a post-secondary program in British Columbia. And it's this really incredible program, 200 people from all over the world, 25% of the student population is uh, Canadian, the rest is from all parts of the world. And we're living in this beautiful campus in the middle of the woods in BC, two-year program. Uh, I was there at a very interesting time. Um, let me just give you a couple of things. Uh, Ben Johnson at the Seoul Olympics. Um, this is kind of trivial, but sort of the, the beginning of the conversation around performance enhancing drugs in sports. And to me, the more interesting part, the shame that Canada felt about being caught cheating uh, was a real moment in, 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 in that ecology. But there were a couple of other significant events, like uh, the fact that my roommate from first year, who was a white South African student by the name of Nick, um, stood on stage uh, with his compatriot, Audrey Motupe, who was uh, a black South African refugee, and they got to announce to the student population that Nelson Mandela had been freed from jail. Um, this was also the time when the college welcomed its first uh, Soviet students. In my first year, we had the first two students from the USSR, Ludmila and Oleg. And I can tell you, uh, I had this whole bit prepared where I was going to show you letters with the stamps and like the power of artifacts, but due to time, I will just tell you the end of the story or the next step in the story. And it's that uh, Ludmila, or Lucy as we called her, uh, was not allowed to return in year two. She was creating very strong ties with my roommate from Fiji, Simon, and there was a real concern that she was going to, uh, to become a deserter. Um, in an ironic twist, <laughs> or bad timing, uh, she was not allowed to return, and it was during my second year at this college that the wall fell. So I have a whole stack of letters from her grieving over this process, and then there's a happy ending to the story that may make it into a play at some point, but more on that later. Now, but I need to tell you, okay, let's talk about displacement. Let's talk about 
uh, inadequacy. Let's talk about feeling lost. Most of the students who went to this college have gone on to do great work all around the world. They've worked in the European Union, they've worked in NGOs, major uh, international projects, right? And there I am, an aspiring 16-year-old artist, going, what's wrong with me? What can I do? Why is my thinking so small? I want to do something and I don't know what. And it was this feeling of displacement that led me to apply and be accepted into the economics program at Auckland University in New Zealand. <laughs> I didn't end up going to Auckland University in New Zealand uh, through another story, but I did end up coming back to Canada and doing a double degree in theater and economics. That's also another place where you feel very displaced. Let me tell you, if you show up to statistics class in dancewear because you're coming from movement, <laughs> you get a lot of funny looks. Um, but at that time, I was still trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure out how to reconcile these two forces within me, this desire to make a difference, to make a change, and the desire to express myself artistically. Um, so, I, uh, <laughs> I found it, and I will tell you where it begins. Um, as it tends to happen in theater, not through anything I did, but through coincidence. Um, Carrie was, uh, my spouse, was practicing to be a puppeteer. And we were in Toronto at the time, and she told her mom, and her mom in Prince George, British Columbia, talked to a friend of hers, and this friend said, oh, my sister's doing a show that, and they need a puppeteer, and that's in St. Catharines, Ontario. So then Carrie went and got herself hired for this show, it was called The Last Drop. And it was a play for elementary school children about a fish and a human named Hugh, who shared the last glass of water in the world. Intriguing for me at that point. Never thought of that being a play for elementary schools. Um, I had an opportunity. I was invited to come into rehearsals. The playwright needed some feedback from an outside eye, and I gave him one good note. It was one of those moments where I went like, I don't understand this, and he said, you're right, it doesn't make sense. So we set up a great friendship. And he said to me, you should come and work with me for six months, and we're gonna work on five different plays. And it was through that internship that I came to MTYP. This is the first time that I came to Winnipeg, and I was flabbergasted. If I were to go back on the slides, but I don't wanna do that, and to show you that building, the first purpose-built theater for young audiences in English Canada, from the ground up, built to do this work. And let me just tell you, give you a little snippet of what I was getting into. Mirror Game, a play for teens about physical abuse amongst uh, teen couples. A verse adaptation of the Odyssey written by John Morell for elementary school students. A full adaptation of The Hobbit and I want to pause there because I just don't want to show you pictures. But I, I can tell you that in, when we were preparing the show, most American adaptations of the, of the story at that time finished with Bilbo stabbing Smog with his blade and killing the dragon. Which, if you're a Tolkien purist, you will know that's not what happens. But this story of the hero, of the great quest, is the only one that is appealing to some people. And they had actually strayed away from what this version of the play did, which is make it a play about greed, about what happens after the dragon's gone, when you have five different nations fighting for the dragon's treasure and one little hobbit trying to stop the war. That, to me, was gold. <laughs> um, I could also tell you about some of the shows that we've done in recent history, but just to give you context, this is In This World, which we did a couple of years ago, a play for teens about consent and about disclosure on uh, sexual assault. This is a play we did last year, Roots, which is about urban violence, about a, a young man who rides the bus until it shuts down because there's violence in his home. And please, this is a show that we're bringing from Australia in February, and I, <laughs> 
The marketing line is, is actually what the show is. It's a Western about dementia. And I can tell you this is one of the most exquisite, heartbreaking pieces of theater I have ever seen. And I showed it to my nine-year-old daughter and we had the most amazing conversation about what happens to some of us as we age. And that's why we're doing that show. But the big aha, the moment. And it begins with a golden report on homelessness. Playwright David S. Craig was driving in his car, so goes the story, and heard some of the statistics from the golden report on homelessness. And the one that completely floored him was that 25% of homeless people in Toronto were children under the age of 12. He was shaken to the core. He needed to do something about it. And what he did was write this exquisite piece of theater about a young boy and his mom who have moved eight times in two years. They're functionally homeless. And it's this incredible place uh, of joy, of hope, and of reality that allows artists and audiences to actually get engaged in a meaningful dis discussion about these subjects. I myself saw the show on the road over 200 times, and I can tell you it didn't fail to move me to make me laugh once. And I could spend the rest of my time now telling you stories about things that happened, so I'm gonna limit myself to two, two of my favorite. One, we are in a theater in the States, uh, and there's a bomb threat called and we have to evacuate the theater. And all of the students and the artists in their costumes and I were sitting in a parking lot and we know it's gonna be a few hours before we're clear to go back in. So we talk to the teachers, we talk to the presenters and we say, let's do this. Let's do the show in a parking lot. Let's do it without sets, let's do it without props. Let's just tell the story. We have to ask you to be really quiet and attentive uh, because it's going to be hard to hear. And we had some of the most magical storytelling I've experienced. You could hear a pin drop in that parking lot until a laugh came. And then there was uproarious laughter. So we stripped it away from everything that had been built around the play. We told the story and it worked. And it worked so well that my second story is about a very courageous young man in New York who at the end of the show, during question and answer, put up his hand and he wanted to know what happened to Danny, the central character. He wanted to know, and these were his words, because I am like Danny. I live through what Danny lives. And he outed himself in front of all of his peers and it changed him and it changed his peers. You could feel it in the room, everybody went, really? Oh, and what do we do about it? So the stories could go on and on and on, but I want to tell you about what that play meant to me here in Winnipeg. I wanted it to open the first season that I programmed. So it was the first show in our 15, 16 season. The timing was impeccable because that year marked the 25th anniversary of the unanimous resolution by the House of Commons to eliminate poverty in Canada by the year 2000, child poverty. Right, so we haven't done that, right? Not only have we not done that, but if you look at a, there's a study, I wanna get the name right here. I'll These are new, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's happening, okay. So, and if you look at, um, yes, it's a study from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives that shows that 40% of indigenous children in Canada live in poverty, 52% in Manitoba, so how can we aspire to be players on the global stage when we can't even clean up our own act here in our country? So it had to happen. Like this show needed to be done. Um, and even though I'd already worked on this play, there were so many lessons that came my way. So many reminders, right? Poverty is not a choice. We need to stop thinking of child poverty as separate from adult poverty. If parents leave in po uh, live in poverty, how could we expect that children won't live through it as well? But the big lesson, and this is the magic, was uh, came the first day we played the show at MTYP. And I went in, and because I've seen the show, I love to watch the audience. 
And in one of the harder moments in this play, I saw this young man in front of me really struggling. Something in the play was moving him in a way that wasn't comfortable. He was clutching his chest, he was hunched over, just struggling. Until his friend sitting next to him reaches out, puts his hand on his shoulder, and helps him through it. And isn't that what theater should be about? About a bunch of people, friends and strangers, sitting in a dark room, sharing a story, feeling, laughing, crying, listening, and reaching out to each other and forming a tighter pond as a community, walking out of that space as a community that's motivated to change, as a closely knit group. I saw that happen right in front of me in that moment. And I think that's the thing I want to talk to you about, no matter how displaced I may have felt or how much of a fake I may feel I am sometimes. You know who's not a fake? Those two kids, that audience. So, what I want to tell you, and this is sort of my, my pitch to you, is uh, I want to go through seven lessons that my audience have taught me. Lesson one, I call it, we should get our guns and kill them. Um, this is a play called Water Under the Bridge, which was being, um, it was uh, created in preparation for the celebrations for the bicentennial of the 1812 war. So it premiered in 2012. And over there, on the right, that's nine-year-old Emma back when she was four or five. And this kid had been involved in this play from inception. There were participatory components, she was involved, she knew the story, she was keen. It's this beautiful story of two young women, one of Caucasian background, one of indigenous background, who are best friends who live across, from their, across the river from each other. And when the war breaks, they're being told that they can no longer be friends. And this is a play for, by the way, five to eight year olds. Let's try to unpack those issues with, 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 with those children, right? Um, the day before we open the show, Emma comes home and she tells me, Papa, we had a presentation on 1812 at our school. And I said, great, tell me what you got from it. And she says to me, well, if the Americans come, we have to get our guns and kill them. <laughs> Do any of you know the musical Into the Woods? It's a brilliant song in it called Children Will Listen. So lesson one is they will listen, therefore get your act together. We have a responsibility in what we put on that stage and what we bring to them. Lesson two, kids love rap. <laughs> Somebody knows this story. Um, in my first year at Carousel Players, I cut raps out of three plays. It's a shortcut. What you're seeing there is how you do it right. This is a production of Cranked uh, by Green Thumb Theater, and it is a play about crystal meth. And they did it right. They work with Kiprios. Kiprios wrote all of the music for it. And you sit in that room when that play begins. Uh, the performer walks on stage, the DJ spinning, and he goes, crank it up. Crank it up! And you're in it. And it's magic. And, you ma and it works, right? When you do it that way. When I just don't know how to compose the music for the song and, the, and I just say, well, I guess the actors could just rap it. We're taking a shortcut. So in an interesting kind of way, Kids Love Rap has become code for people who've worked with me about when we make assumptions about the audience, uninformed assumptions. The only way to fight that is that you actually need to be working with children, with young people, to find out what they like, what they don't like, what they know, what they can do, what they can't do. You don't make the assumptions, they tell you. Lesson three, shoot the puck. 
So this is a play by Winnipegger James Durham called The Big League. And it's about a, a young man who wants to make it into a peewee hockey team. And it's about the pressure that he feels from his dad to become a hockey star. It's a great play. Um, I was working at it in St. Catharines and I told Jeff, the actor who played Tommy, um, at, a, at the key, at the climax, the emotional climax of the play, Tommy's about to score a goal at this tryout and, and this is gonna be his moment. So of course, in theater land, time freezes and he turns to the audience and he says, this is it, this is my moment. And he starts talking about what he's feeling in that moment. It's a beautiful speech. I had warned Jeff, you're taking too long. You're feeling too much. So I go to see the show in a school one day and I'm bringing a playwright who says he wants to write for young audiences and we're sitting there and that day Jeff decided to feel it. He took his time. Well, that beautiful speech was never heard because he took so long that 250 children in a gym started screaming, shoot, shoot the puck, shoot. You're never gonna drown 200 voices, right? So he just had to move on. So shoot the puck is, means just stay ahead of them, right? Know how far you can go and just stay a step ahead. Because if they know what's coming, you're lost. You're not sad. So theater in North America is very action driven. We say that you don't play an emotion, you don't even create a character. You play a set of actions. Actions define character. What you do tells us who you are. And actions trigger emotion. What I do to you will make you feel something. So we focus on action, action, action. Do something. We speak of acting as, being, as doing something to someone for a reason. It's all action, right? Well, then you go somewhere else in the world, like Denmark, and you have this incredible play called The Story of the Little Gentleman. And it's a story of a gentleman who's sad. The play doesn't tell you why. There's nothing to make the little gentleman sad. He's just sad. And in rehearsals, <laughs> the director kept telling this actor, who was a very seasoned actor, you're faking it. I don't buy it. I don't think you're sad. And the actor would give all the reasons, say, well, I have nothing to play in this scene. I don't have an action. How, you know? Well, you're faking it. So I'm there on opening night. And the little gentleman walks on stage. He's sad. And a child, a five-year-old in the audience goes, you're not sad. You're not really sad. <laughs> Maybe because his craft that he'd spent years refining was being questioned by a five-year-old, the actor became really sad. <laughs> And it's not until then that that child stopped. The truth is powerful. The truth is where it's at. Was she like a zombie or something? I've lost track of which lesson I'm at, but that's... So we had this really interesting reworking of a, a play called The Power of Harriet T, the story of Harriet Tubman. And uh, there's a moment in the play where Harriet talks about, in one of her journeys, how her mouth got infected and how she had to take out her gun and knock off the top row of teeth so she could keep going. And uh, I was, again, present at a show, and during the question and answer period, this audience member said, so, was she like a zombie or something? And the actors got really defensive, right? They felt like this child was being disruptive, was trying to call them out, was trying to be a, a smart aleck, right? And I realized, uh-uh, listen. That moment that was so clear where Harriet would describe what happened, there was a movement and there was a sound that the musicians played underneath it and it all came together. It had been sharp and clear and over the course of repetition after doing the show for four or five weeks, it had gotten soft. It wasn't clear. I don't think I was getting it. And that child in the audience thought that Harriet had shot herself in the mouth. And that's why the question came up, like, 
the only way I can understand this is she was like a zombie for the rest of her life, right? So don't assume that they're trying to disrupt you. Listen. Listen, because they have insight to offer. Oh, yeah. This is... Uh, so what was she charged with? So tagged is another great play from Green Thumb Theater. Uh, we were all trying to wrap our brains around cyberbullying and sort of the access to um, that level of exposure that teens have. And Green Thumb created this really sharp little um, police drama, right? There's a police investigation about this incident. And uh, it's, it's, it feels like a really cool Canadian episode of Law and Order, right? It, it fires on all cylinders, it goes, it moves, right? But at the end of the show, again, an audience member goes, so what was she charged with? And the actors couldn't answer the question. And neither could the playwright or the director. In really wanting to make a difference, they took a shortcut. And they glossed over the fact that at that time in Canadian legislation, there was nothing this young woman could be charged with. And again, just like in the example with Harriet, that audience member wasn't trying to disrupt. They were, like, the class had been studying and they were really wanting to get to the bottom of it and they thought, you know something I don't know, right? But in this case, the artists, in, in their passion for getting something across, had circumvented the truth, had bypassed a key piece of information. And guess what? They called us on it. And seventh, I know it's seventh because it's the last one, um, what else is wrong with us? And this happened to me, I was, uh, in my touring days, I took this show, Smokescreen, into many, many schools and theaters. And um, it was right at the beginning of our discussions, our public discussions on the legalization of marijuana. So this play was trying to open up some of those conversations. And uh, as you do when you're school touring, we're there early in the morning, we're unloading the set into the school, and we have a team of students who are helping us load the show into the school. And this, um, this young fellow comes up to me and says, so uh, you're doing a play, right? Yeah, we are. So what else is wrong with us? And that question has stayed with me since then, right? Again, in our desire to be impactful, to do something special, the only relationship we have with teen audiences is where we bring them the date rape play, the drug play, the drinking play, the don't do this play. What else is wrong with us? I've never been called out like that in my career again, and I hope I never do, right? So not only do you want to ask questions, but can we take a little time to celebrate? Can we take a little time to empower? So now we come to the point of this conversation where I try to tell you what I know about changing the world. So how do we change the world? Well, for one thing, I believe you have to do it with the people who want to do it, the people who have the passion to do it. And I really believe in my heart of hearts that that is young people. They want to do it, so let's do it with them. We need to prepare, though. We don't want to be called out on shortcuts. We don't, want to, we don't want to make any of those assumptions. We don't want to go, kids love rap, right? We need to be thoroughly, thoroughly prepared. That's where artistic rigor comes into play. We need to listen, right? From inception, from the beginning of a project, all the way through to opening, and into, like I said, week five, week six, Week, week six, whenever we're working, we have to be prepared to listen, to hear what they're getting, to let them inform what we do. We also need to inspire. If the work is not provocative, if the work does not ask difficult questions, if it doesn't make everybody in the audience, and I mean everybody, because I mean 
Children and young people don't come to the theater by themselves. They're brought by somebody else, whether it's a teacher, a principal, a parent, a grandparent. If the work does not inspire every person in the audience, we're gonna walk out and say, that was a good time. Hopefully, at least that. But it must inspire. And, most importantly, we need to let them own the change. Uh, I think it's Augusto Boal who formulated the whole theory around theater of the oppressed, who tells, this is his story, about doing political theater in Brazil. And in his play, the actors were on stage and they were calling for everybody to join the revolution. Let's take up arms and change the world. Let's start the revolution. And at the end of the show, somebody walks up to them and says, okay, let's, I have weapons, let's do it. And Boal speaks about the shame that he felt and he swore never to be prescriptive again, never to say, to, to recommend anything that he wasn't prepared to do. And that's where the whole approach of theater of the press comes from in terms of letting the audience, letting the other side tell you what to do. My version of that story is working on the commotion project that was brought up earlier, working with teens devising plays. And in that process, we did a lot of social critique, a lot of social criticism. We had to look, because we're improvising the work. So there's tons of stereotypes, ton, ton, tons of gender assumptions, tons of um, racial assumptions, cultural assumptions that are put into the work. And we always want to strip them away, look at them, see what's informed by our media super peers, see what we believe in. And we always say, and we all need to be able to stand behind each and everything that is said by this piece of theater. So in that process, we were working at a school in uh, Well and St. Catharines, and it was a school, it wasn't an art school. It was a school where kids went to the drama room because it was a safe place. These were kids who were living pretty hard lives. But the drama teacher was the person who welcomed them and who made them feel safe. And this teacher, Miss Garrett, in very well-intentioned uh, buy-in into the process, at one point when we're working on the play says, can I question the assumption about this character who's like a single mom working at Walmart? Feels like a bit of a stereotype, right? Like we're just saying. And I watched some of those young people get up and say, oh no, Miss Garrett, we know that woman. We know that's not everybody, but we know that woman. We can stand by that story. And we all had to back off and say, yes. That's the, you know that story, you can own that, then go to town. And I think that's the key piece, is that we, if we don't let young people own the change, then we're gonna be back in Kids Love Rap Land. So, with those seven little tidbits of how I create my work, and with those ideas, working primarily with young people to change the world. That's how we do it. Thank you. <laughs>